We do want to get to the latest on the Israel-Hamas war, and as always, we are joined by Dr. Alon Burstein to break down the latest on what's happening. Uh, welcome in, Dr. Burstein. We do want to get right into the news, as always. Egypt is constructing a wall along its border with the Gaza Strip and Rafah, where 1.3 million civilians remain displaced as Israel clashes with Hamas terrorists. Uh, Arab media first reported the construction back in December, and now the Wall Street Journal and New York Times have confirmed it as well. Uh, alone, is there a history of people slipping through the border? And if so, how do people usually do it? First of all, good to see you. Um, in general, the border between the Gaza Strip and the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, that is the border that cuts the Rafah city basically in half, has been fairly fortified. What happened was Hamas built all these tunnels underneath the border, and that's how they've been smuggling weapons in. This has been an ongoing problem for well over 20 years. It, it dates back to when Israel controlled the Gaza Strip. And I mean, and we had active forces on the ground. They were already smuggling tunnels underneath the, the what's called the Philadelphia Line. So in general, there has not been sort of a mass immigration or flood or breakthrough of the border between Egypt and Gaza. That border is quite fortified. In turn, what's happening now is also very unprecedented. You've never had this amount of people that are sort of barricaded within the town of Rafah, that if Israel does end up invading, if they haven't evacuated, where are they gonna go? Really, they don't have anywhere to go except for a small corridor, what's called the Moasi area, in the northern parts of Rafah, or towards the border. Can they actually get over the border? It is highly doubtful, in my opinion, that Egypt's gonna, you know, God forbid, open fire at you know, civilians as they're coming towards the border, so maybe the gates of the Rafah crossing will just be opened. Unclear, I think it's unclear to Egypt also. That's one of the reasons that they're now building this extra line to say, even if the border is breached, let's have this extra area, which really can only be described as an open air prison, like Gaza has been described, like a compound. They're building this, I mean, six meter, seven meter, I'm not sure what that is in feet, high wall in order to enclose an area that if Palestinians break through, so that they can't get through to Egypt. So it's sort of like another line of defense, almost, if you will, against the mass flood of Palestinians who would get into Egypt. That's what at least the Egyptian authorities are hoping to maintain. Uh, we just got this in within the past couple hours. This is a readout uh, between President Biden and Bibi Netanyahu. It, it reads, it's a little bit extensive, but I, I do want to read the full thing. It says, President Joseph R. Biden spoke today with Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu of Israel. The president and the prime minister discussed ongoing hostage negotiations. The president reaffirmed his commitment to working tirelessly to support the release of all hostages as soon as possible, recognizing their appalling situation after 132 days in Hamas captivity. The president and the prime minister also discussed the situation in Gaza and the urgency of ensuring that humanitarian assistance is able to get to Palestinian civilians in desperate need. The president also raised the situation in Rafah and reiterated his view that a military operation should not proceed without a credible and executable plan for ensuring the safety and support for the civilians in Rafah. Uh, alone, what do you think the U.S. likely means by credible and executable plan in Rafah specifically? I think, honestly, the United States does not think that Israel has a plan that it can actually be implemented in order to actually protect the Palestinian civilians. And that's why what they're demanding of Israel is not just a plan, but a plan that can be done. So in other words, to not have Israel present to the United States a plan that's saying, well, we're allowing Palestinian civilians to go to the Mwasi area. Again, the Mwasi area is this narrow corridor in the northern parts of Rafah. It already is entirely overcrowded. The idea of adding another million Palestinians to this area that in the past housed about 12,000 people, now is housing about 400, 500,000. That's not realistic. That's a plan. That's something that Israel could say, well, we allowed that. That's what the United States is meaning by executable. Not just a plan that's something like that, something that actually can be done in order to preserve the lives of Palestinian civilians. What we're seeing is that in the United States, they're, they're taking a bit of a different stance than the rest of the world. The rest of the world is simply telling Israel, don't do it. We have France, Canada, Belgium, the United Kingdom, Australia, lot, lots of uh, different countries have issued warnings to Israel saying, do not invade Rafah, it's going to be a bloodbath. The United States is not saying that. They're saying, certainly you can invade Rafah if you need to, but you first need to actually present us with a plan that is reliable. Moreover, the, I believe, um, State Department spokesperson said yesterday, not only that 
the United States is not going to support this plan unless they are presented with a credible and executable plan. But they also said, we're looking forward to reviewing it. That also adds another layer. It's saying it's not enough for Israel, as far if it wants the United States support, which it certainly does. It's not enough to just say, we are going to execute this. The United States wants to review the plan first. It wants to authorize the plan first. I think what we're really seeing here is possibly a counter tactic from the U.S. administration telling the Netanyahu government, okay, you didn't go with us to a hostage deal. Now we're going to hold up your Rafah invasion. It's going to be that for that. Netanyahu wants to invade Rafah before a hostage deal. This is at least the news that is coming out of Israel. Netanyahu really prefers first invading Rafah, then only going to this truce. The United States wants the truce first. Netanyahu said that he's not sending delegates back to the negotiations in, because he wants to have them forestalled until the invasion happens. I think the U.S. is sort of throwing him back one, saying, okay, so be it. We're not supporting your invasion until you present us with plans that you're going to execute, and we're going to review them first in order to see, do we actually support this? Are we going to protect you as Israel is going to come under monumental international condemnation for the invasion? Is the United States going to protect it or not? I think that's what the administration is trying to achieve with these repeated warnings that are coming out by now every single day. It's been a couple days since you and I last spoke. Are there any new indicators out there at this point alone to, to say perhaps when a more extended IDF incursion could take place in Rafa, or, or are we still just kind of waiting? Not publicly. One of the things that have happened, though, is there's been a, a very dramatic, almost um, split within Israel's war cabinet. Israel's war cabinet, which is separate from the main cabinet of the government, this is the cabinet that's supposed to actually decide how the war is executed, has in it four main actors. That is Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant, both of them from the Likud party, and then Minister Gantz and Minister Eisenkot, both of them from the status list. Gantz and Eisenkot, who are in opposition to Netanyahu, they came in just in order to help run the war, they favor the hostage deal first. They think that Israel should go to hostage deal. They have a whole other plan. They think Israel should go to hostage deal, postpone the invasion of Rafah, get international support. They also are very worried about the fact that Hamas is starting to regain some civilian control in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Gantz and Eisenkot want Israel to go to hostage deal, release hostages, and then worry about Rafah later. Netanyahu, in turn, wants to first go to the invasion of Rafah. In his mind, if Israel pauses, it will not be able to re-engage the war, and therefore it needs to, first and foremost, go for the invasion. What happened in the last several days is that Netanyahu, without consulting the war cabinet, decided on his own volition, he's prime minister, he can do that, decided on his own volition that he is not going to send more delegates to the negotiations. So that's a slap in the face of the war cabinet. After he refused to send delegations to the negotiations in Cairo, today, CIA director William Barnes came to Israel. So if Israel is not going to send delegates, he came to Israel. Netanyahu also met with him alone, did not invite the war cabinet met with him and the head of the Mossad alone. So that split in Israel's internal politics may end up being very, very influential because if Netanyahu was pushing the Rafah invasion and in turn, Yanks and Eisenkot wanted to hold it off, we're seeing that in Israel's war cabinet, they aren't working together anymore. And Netanyahu could theoretically order the invasion. So it may be expedited a little bit. Netanyahu wants the invasion to be completed by Ramadan. That's March 10th, March 11th. So maybe we're seeing this is going to be expedited. And I think the United States is seeing this and that's one of the reasons they're saying not so fast. We have some video, really some dramatic video that we want to show. No doubt you've seen it by now. Uh, Israeli forces stormed the main hospital in southern Gaza today, hours after Israeli fire killed a patient and wounded six others inside the complex, per the AP. Uh, the Israeli army said that it was seeking the remains of hostages taken by Hamas. Uh, alone, what more do we know about how the IDF carried about this operation? We obviously just saw some video. Uh, and aside from how they carried out the operation, do we know if they actually found what they were looking for? So this is the Al Nasser Hospital in Han Yunus, what we're seeing. It's the biggest hospital, as you said, in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. For already roughly two to three weeks, the IDF has been besieging both this hospital and the Al-Amal Hospital, also in Khan Yunis, because Hamas has a lot of activity that it carries out from the hospitals. In the last 24 hours, the IDF took it up a notch, and they started announcing to people in the Al-Nasser, in the Al-Nasser Hospital, and it's important to understand that in the hospitals, there are, are scores of internally displaced people, because these usually take refuge in the hospital. The IDF started announcing to them, you have to evacuate. That means the IDF is going to invade. Then, the IDF released a phone call that its coordinator for the Palestinian territories had with the administrator of the hospital saying, we have ample evidence that Hamas is operating from within the hospital. You have 12 hours to 
stop to shut this down and get them to come out. Otherwise, we're going to invade. After that happened, the IDF invaded the hospital. The IDF states that it was looking for either live hostages or the bodies of hostages. And it says that it had very, very credible intelligence from two different sources. One is the hostages that were released that managed to identify that they were held at one point or another in El Nasser Hospital. Another was from Palestinians who have been arrested in the Gaza Strip, who also said that there are either live or at least the bodies of hostages are held in, in El Nasser Hospital. As a result of this intelligence, the IDF decided to invade the hospital. Thus far, in the invasion, it says that it has found evidence that the dead bodies of hostages were in the hospital. However, they're not there anymore. There are reports coming from local sources on the ground that the IDF is actually unearthing the makeshift graves around the hospital in order to take to inspect if they belong to hostages. This happened prior previously in other parts of Hanunis that was reported that the IDF was unearthing graves in order to take the bodies back to Israel to check if they were in fact how the bodies of hostages. Thus far, the IDF has not found either the bodies of hostages or live hostages. In turn, it did find a substantial amount of weaponry in the hospital. It does state that it's arrested large amounts of Hamas operatives within the hospital. I have seen no reports that the operation is over. So the IDF has said we haven't found anything, but at the same time, I think it's still ongoing. One of the rumors that was circulating, at least in local news sources in Israel, is that the IDF suspects that there's a substantial tunnel underneath the hospital. So it is possible we're going to see this activity go on for days. It remains to be seen. We'll be watching southern Gaza for sure, but I want to move up north, northern Israel, southern Lebanon. This is video of uh, the area around northern Israel and southern Lebanon. There has been an increase in fighting between the IDF and Hezbollah this week. On Wednesday, two Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon killed three Hezbollah members as well as 10 civilians, according to Lebanese state media, which would make it the deadliest day in more than four months of cross-border exchanges, according to the Associated Press. Hezbollah said today that it fired dozens of rockets at a northern Israeli town in what they call a, quote, preliminary response. We've heard many times, doctor, since October 7th, that Hezbollah is a much more powerful entity compared to Hamas, but what kind of response are they actually capable of? Or maybe the better question, is what are they capable that falls within the unwritten rules of the conflict? So that's, you're right, that, that really is somewhat of a different question because what has happened, as we've talked about several times, is that since October 8th, when Hezbollah entered the conflict, it has not escalated beyond what the sort of each side is willing to, I'll one-up you this much, I'll one-up you this much, I'll one-up you this much. So they could one-up in some ways. What happened is two days ago, Hezbollah launched a large barrage of rockets and missiles, including 11 Grad missiles, which are much stronger missiles than they've used up until now in the war. These landed in several different areas in the northern parts of Israel. One of them landed in an IDF base and killed a 20-year-old female soldier and managed to injure also eight more soldiers. In response, the IDF carried out these massive bombings that are being seen. This one, I believe, is in the Anabatia area or in Marun Aras. In Anabatia was the most deadliest attack in which, according to al Miaden, that is a Lebanese Hezbollah affiliate, between eight and ten people were killed. The idea stated that one of the people killed was one of the commanders of the Radwan force, which is Hezbollah's main commando units, and that he was a target of the attack. In response to that, Hezbollah today launched a barrage of over 37 rockets and missiles, and as you stated, said, wait a minute, this is just the first retaliation. Likely what we're going to see is Hezbollah launching more substantial rockets and missiles. Hezbollah has a wide array of rockets and missiles, and we've seen over the last couple of months that they have been upping the ante, so to speak, each time sending their regular rockets, then Borkan rockets, then the Rafik-1 rockets, now the Grad missiles. So each one of these is a little more substantial, a little more accurate, packs more punch. So they do have the ability to escalate further. They also have the ability to launch rockets even further. And they may do that. They may actually say, now we're going to start launching rockets further down south in Israel, towards Haifa, towards the areas of Netanya, possibly even towards Tel Aviv. They would be fearful of doing that because Israel's retaliation would be massive. However, if they launch one rocket towards Tel Aviv, it's unlikely that Israel is going to carry out an all invasion of Lebanon, right? It'll just be another escalation. Hezbollah is also quite fearful of what is happening on the diplomatic front. In the, in the diplomatic channels, there have been negotiations that looked like they may be coming fruitful, 
between Israel and Lebanon. These were led by the U.S. special envoy to the region, Amos Hochstein, as well as by France. And the two sides, the Lebanese government and the Israeli government, have been presented in documents which both sides are very, very hesitantly possibly agreeing to. These include Hezbollah being pulled up so, uh, 10 kilometers, I'll say about six miles maybe, um, north of the border with Israel, the Lebanese army deploying on the border instead, the two sides entering negotiations. The thing is, Lebanon can agree to this, Israel can agree to this, Hezbollah does not agree to this. Hezbollah has to be the one to agree to pull up, otherwise the only ones who could force him to pull up is Israel. And that's one of the reasons also, I would argue, for these escalations, Hezbollah is trying to show the regional actors, you can agree all you want. Lebanon, you can agree. Israel, you can agree. We're still here, and you have to contend with us. And if you don't contend with us, we can. We have the, the possibility of escalating more and more. And that's what we're seeing in these last rounds of rockets, missiles, grads. Now Hezbollah is going to fire either more grads or escalate further, pushing the border even further down south of their rockets. That's the context in which we're seeing these escalations. There's one last thing I want to hit before we go here, moving a little bit away from Israel. The AP says the head of the United Nations nuclear watchdog warned this week that Iran is, quote, not entirely transparent regarding its atomic program, particularly after an official who once led Tehran's program announced the Islamic Republic has all the pieces for a weapon, quote, in their hands uh, alone. I remember around the new year that there were reports that Iran was accelerating uranium enrichment. That basically is a sign of progress with their nuclear program. What are the international implications of Iran having nuclear capabilities? If it does get to that, the international implications are going to be vast. Iran wants to be a regional player, and it is very, very unlikely that they would use nuclear weapons, right? India and Pakistan both have nuclear weapons. They've gone so far to three very, very deadly wars with each other. They haven't used nuclear weapons. Russia has nuclear weapons. It hasn't deployed them in Ukraine. It's unlikely that they would use them. What that is is an insurance policy. It's an insurance policy for the country to say you can't attack us. If you attack us, you should know we always have the option to push the button. We always have that. We always have the option to, if we are actually threatened, we can actually make it a zero-sum game where we will destroy the other side. The implications would be several. First of all, the Iranian affiliates, these militias, we see Hezbollah, the Houthis, but we've also seen all these other militias in Iraq and Syria, would become a lot more powerful, not because they would be armed with nuclear weapons, but because they could be supplied by weapons from Iran much more easily, because Iran would not have to fear the retaliation. Right now, if Iran was openly sending weapons publicly to the Houthis, for example, they may come under U.S. fire. Well, if they have nuclear weapons, that's a game changer. Another thing is the regional actors are likely going to enter into an arms race. Iran's great rival in the Islamic world is Saudi Arabia. That's one of the reasons Saudi Arabia wants to go to normalization with Israel. They want a defense pact against Iran. If Iran has nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia is going to try to get nuclear weapons. There's going to be no, no way that Saudi Arabia does not allow that. It's, again, at the level of the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. So that's not going to happen. What may happen is Saudi Arabia will say, okay, we won't develop a nuclear program, but we demand that the United States deploy nuclear weapons within our country as um, the, as an insurance policy. We're going to see an arms race, no matter how we see it, how you slice it, in the Middle East. Israel, according to international reports, has nuclear weapons. Israel's never acknowledged it has nuclear weapons. Of course it does. But Israel's never publicly said that it does. That, that program may become public. Israel may accelerate its own amount of nuclear weapons. That's, those are going to be the regional um, implications on the long term. On the short term, though, what we're going to see is the militias becoming a lot more emboldened, because if right now they need to operate clandestinely as they get weapons or diplomatic support from Iran, Iran will all of a sudden feel a lot more confident and have no problem doing this publicly, which will be not a game changer, maybe, but will certainly influence the way the war is going on. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Dr. Alon Burstein, we always appreciate your time this evening. Uh, we also look forward to your daily YouTube updates on the war. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night.